In the early morning hours of June 8, 2020, and deep in the grasslands of Johannesburg, an environmental worker stumbled across a terrible scene. The body of a young woman had been found, bearing the most devastating of wounds. What followed was an extensive search operation to find her killer, and, as it turns out, investigators wouldn't have to look too far, because the surveillance footage of one trusted camera would firmly place the spotlight on a callous man with a very concerning motive. An all too familiar motive that would, once again, stir the emotions of a nation. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, folks. My name is Adrian, and welcome or welcome back to Coffeehouse Crime. Today we're looking at the terrible case of Seofatso Pule. This case has been on my radar for quite some time, and it underlines the horrifying truth of South Africa's gender-based violence. But, thankfully, in this story, justice has finally been served. By the way, I post true crime and strange cases here weekly, so if that does sound like your kind of thing, please consider subscribing to the channel, it really does help me out. And now, with that said, please grab yourself a coffee, pull up a seat, and get ready for the deep dive. This is the case of Seofatso Pule. Welcome to South Africa. This vast and beautiful country is, unsurprisingly, located at the bottommost tip of the vast continent. With a population of 55 million residents, it has, over time, become a varied and multicultural society steeped in rich and deep history. Flying over our case today, we find ourselves touching down in the vibrant city of Johannesburg. Nicknamed Joburg for short, the city has become well known as the nation's capital for business. After rather humble beginnings as a mining town, Johannesburg has become recognized as a major world city and economic capital of both southern and sub-Saharan Africa. Take a step outside the city and you're met with expansive grassland known as Veld. And explore more into the city's metro area and you'll find more than 10 million people calling it home. And it's here in Johannesburg that we find beautiful Seofatso Pule, a 28-year-old woman living and working in the township of Soweto. Born in 1992 to her parents Lungi and Makina Mashiane, Seofatso was raised alongside her two brothers and her sister Mimi, who she was incredibly close to. Seho Fatso was often affectionately referred to by the first half of her name, Seho, which, for the rest of her story, I'll be using to make things easier. For 17 happy years, the family peacefully lived in this township. Seho's parents were extremely loving and caring, and with a supportive family, she excelled at school, taking a keen interest in art and design. Sadly, before Seho was able to graduate from high school, both of her parents tragically passed away, though we don't actually know how or why. But, of course, it left the family in ruins. And so, from the year 2009 onwards, Seho and her siblings would be raised by their aunt, Priscilla Giwu, who lived nearby. Her younger sister, Mimi, took the loss of her parents very, very harshly, and in the following years, Eden blamed them for not being around for their children anymore. Mimi was depressed, distraught, and entirely broken. And during this time frame, Seho took the role of a supporting and caring older sister, helping her through the darkest of days. I think this is important to mention in our story, because Seho, she was the most devoted and understanding of people, and always had time to help others in their time of need. Moving into adulthood, she dived into her artistic passions, which eventually translated into a love of beauty, fashion, and makeup. It was after studying art and design in college that she secured herself a well-suited job in the cosmetics store MAC. And while working here, she simultaneously trained to eventually move into the company's marketing team. Seho was young, talented, attractive, and intelligent. And despite having several boyfriends throughout her adult years, there would be one fateful relationship that would change her life forever, for better or for worse. This man went by the name of Ntutuko Shoba. Now, not much is known about Ntutuko's younger years. However, we do know that the two met back in high school, and he came from a rather wealthy family. Despite initially crossing paths in their school days, no substantial friendship blossomed until much later on. With these passing years, Ntutuko found his feet as an IT specialist and stock analyst, and the work was extremely lucrative. It is reported that he earned around 36,000 rand per month doing this, which is the equivalent of £1,600, or almost $2,000. 
And while this may not sound like much in the West, it is considered a very healthy wage in South Africa's turbulent economy. Now, unfortunately, Ntuthiko wasn't all too much of a man, and quite the contrary, he was known to be somewhat of a player. He deceptively had multiple girlfriends at the same time. It was in the year 2019 that he ended up dating Seho at the very same time as dating another woman, Rosetta Motse. Ntuthiko described his relationship with Seho as casual, where they met up every now and then for a night out, partied, and sometimes took things to the bedroom. But as for Rosetta, she was much more of a serious relationship. Relationship. Both of his partners knew that each other existed, which of course created a lot of tension between the three. But Antutheko seemed to be rather adamant that he was committed to Rosetta. And although the two planned to marry, very little did they know that, in the background, Seho had actually fallen pregnant with his child. Upon realising this and consulting Antutheko about it, they both agreed that an abortion was probably the right option. And, of course, this left both of them devastated. The abortion went ahead as planned, and as the year passed by, Ntuthiko and Rosetta were able to secure a deposit for their wedding. Now, you'd think that after this marriage deposit and an abortion, things would fizzle out between Seho and this man whore. However, you'd be wrong, because the affair persisted. Rosetta was adamant that, with the wedding plans, Ntuthika was only interested in her. And to add to his commitment, they even had a home and joint bank accounts together. Shockingly, however, Seho would once again fall pregnant with his child, but this time, she waited a few months to tell him. And unlike the previous occasion, she believed it was far too late to terminate the pregnancy. In February 2020, Seho texted him the following. We have a situation, and one that needs to be dealt with. I need your support, and time is not on our side. Because I want to start going for my checkups, and I don't want to risk the pregnancy. I'm in a fragile state. After informing him of her pregnancy, Ntuthiko did not take it well. He had no intention to take responsibility over this baby, as his vision of the future was firmly with his fiancée, Rosetta. Although he eventually promised to join her appointments at the local doctor, he never actually showed up. And as time went by, it would be months before Seho could make any of her own appointments. Usually being the one to engage in communication between the two, she would once again WhatsApp and Tuthiko. I know you don't want this child, but I was not going to live with myself. I already aborted one, I'm not that evil. I just felt God was going to punish me for doing that. And to think it was not my first time doing it. Sorry for ruining your plans of life. I did not mean to. And Tuthiko eventually responded with, you are getting yourself frustrated because you are forcing yourself to be here. It's not natural. And Tuthiko was clearly beginning to show his impatience and frustration with Seho. And moving forward, he always made excuses not to see her. Now, this avoidance made perfect sense, as he had not actually told Rosetta about the baby. Seho was all too aware of this fact as well. And in another message, she said, Live your life happy with your girlfriend, because it seems like I'm going to be a problem. Or are you stressed you're having a baby with me and not with your girlfriend? I did not choose to be pregnant twice with your child. As the months went by and Seho's pregnancy progressed, hostility between the two lovers worsened. However, she at least managed to convince Ntuthiko to help pay for her medical checkups. And by March 2020, he finally began to send her money. But alongside progress came deterioration too. Because although he had initially promised to tell his family about the baby by the end of the month, he unfortunately showed his true character and failed to tell the truth. Despite the ongoing drama, Seho was incredibly excited to meet her baby, which, by the way, she had learned would be a girl. But as the month of May came into existence, Seho started to receive threatening messages from an unknown number. I'm coming to your workplace, the message read. Keep disrespecting me, Wena. Woman to woman, how do you feel sleeping with another woman's man like that? You are the pits. Now, Seho wasn't scared. She replied with, if you are really that hurt, babe, I promise if you carry on like this with me, you really are going to a mental institution. And imagine how happy I'm going to be with your so-called man once you are gone. The unknown number bounced back with, stop being so generous with your cook. Look now, there are so many possibilities of who the father really is. I feel for you, sister. If you weren't able to guess, the word cook is South African slang for a woman's private area. 
and is often seen as a rather rude remark. Although who these messages were from was never actually confirmed, it is strongly assumed that it was from Ntuthiko's soon-to-be wife, Rosetta. Rosetta would also go on to say that Seho had HIV and that she should probably go get tested. However, considering how emotionally loaded she was, this was probably fake. Seho's family continued to live as best as they could while awaiting for the arrival of her new daughter, and although the relationship side of things were quite rocky, they still were very excited about what the future may bring. However, you can likely guess where this is going, because that future they had envisioned would never actually happen, and on June the 4th, 2020, Seho disappeared. Later that June evening, Priscilla received a phone call from her niece, Seho. She said she was at Antuthiko's apartment, but unfortunately, the two had spent most of the day arguing. She further said she'd be on her way back home in just a few minutes. However, the hours passed by after this, and her niece failed to return home. As the morning crept in without any sign of her, the worried family made the decision to inform the local authorities. And as word got out, Seho's family and her friends took to social media to help find her. However, these efforts seemed to be in vain. Days passed, and still, her silence remained painfully present. Tragically, three days later, on the morning of June the 8th, their worst fears would be realised. A local maintenance worker clearing litter from a nearby veld came across a very terrible discovery. In a quiet area with little human traffic lay a site commonly used to dump trash and unwanted belongings. It was while clearing some of the debris from the grassland that the maintenance worker noticed something swaying above the underbrush. He gazed up and focused to get a better look, and horrifyingly, in front of him was the hanging body of a woman. She was covered in blood, a wound present in the middle of her chest, and, tragically, appeared to be heavily pregnant. Horrified by the discovery, this environmental worker fled back to the local town to notify the authorities immediately. Upon arrival, officers were horrified to confirm the worker's reports, and after taking a body down from the tree, they concluded that the wound on her chest was from a single gunshot. Autopsy reports confirmed that the woman was around 31 weeks pregnant, meaning that, theoretically, the child could have survived after her death. But, tragically, that would not be the case. Both the mother and her unborn child were dead. As you can likely guess, Seo Fatso's family were extremely devastated by the news, and those grave concerns would eventually turn into a horrific reality for the family. Now, the entire family was very clued up when it came to Seho's issues with Ntuthiko, and so it took no time at all for investigators to start looking his way in suspicion. But Ntuthiko was very coy with officers, providing almost no information to them. However, after realising that the building he lived in had a surveillance camera, authorities decided to take a closer look. And to the surprise of absolutely no one at all, it was there they found the last known images of Seo Fatso alive. At 10pm on the evening of June the 4th, 2020, a surveillance camera captured Seho and Ntuthiko leaving his apartment complex. The two eventually re-entered the building soon after, but six minutes later at 10.06pm they re-emerged. Exiting the gate before standing next to the road, a car, assumed to be a taxi or an Uber, eventually showed up. It was at this moment that the grey jeep pulled up next to the pair. Seho wearily approached the passenger door, and you can see she was very apprehensive in doing so. But eventually, she stepped inside this vehicle, which then drove off. Now, as Seho approached the vehicle, Ntuthiko is seen returning to the building. And strangely enough, roughly three minutes of surveillance footage is missing from this camera, skipping from 10.06 to 10.09pm. It is not entirely known why these minutes are unaccounted for, However, the building's owner claims that the camera is only activated if there's enough movement near the fence. Now, I guess that is fair enough, but what actually happened in those three minutes is a complete mystery to everyone. However, it is assumed that Ntuthiko, Seho, and that driver spent all three minutes together. Now, luckily, this did give the police a solid lead, which, of course, was the vehicle that Seho stepped into and only a few days later, this car was finally tracked down. Upon questioning and further investigation, it was learned that this vehicle belonged to a young woman living in the area, and although she did have a solid alibi for where she was that night, her boyfriend was a different story. 
The boyfriend, named Muzikayase Melapane, was a man in his twenties. Rather peculiarly, but not only did his age match Seiho and Ntuthiko, but it turns out that both men had even attended the same high school together. This fact, along with the surveillance footage, was enough to arrest Muzikayase on June the 15th, only 11 days after the murder. And I'm sure that this worried Ntuthiko sick. Now, Muzikaise clearly had a spine with the consistency of jelly, and the man crumbled immediately under interrogation pressure. He almost instantly pinned the murder on Tuthiko, claiming that he was merely the driver, simply instructed to dispose of the body. Now, a confession is great, but with a lack of evidence available to back up these claims, and Tuthiko was off the hook for now. We're moving forward by half a year, but it wasn't until January 2021 that Muzikaise changed his story. Pleading guilty, he now claimed that he'd been hired by the man to kill Seho for 70,000 rands, the equivalent of 31,000 pounds or $39,000. It is with this new information in mind, alongside fresh evidence found by the authorities, that Ntuthiko was finally arrested on suspicion of murder just one month later. And as you can likely guess, he would plead innocent right up and through his trial. Moving into the legal proceedings of this case, Ntuthiko's trial began in July 2022, which was more than two years after Seho's brutal murder. And using the surveillance footage, circumstantial information, and witness testimonies, the prosecution had built up a scattered yet strong case against him. To begin with, Muzikayasi claimed that this was actually their second attempt at murdering Seho, and allegedly, they had tried to kidnap her from a McDonald's a few days prior. A total of 20 phone calls took place between the two men from May the 29th to June the 4th, and they had clearly formulated a new plan during this time frame. The plan was quite simple, really. Entuthiko was to tempt Seho out by buying new clothes for the baby, and after having dinner at his house while they talked things through, Muzikaise would pose as an Uber driver to pick her up, and in return for his actions, which included murdering and then disposing of her body, he would then be paid 70,000 rands. Rightfully so, but Seho seemed apprehensive to get into the vehicle. Her driver seemed drunk behind the wheel, which, sadly, was in fact true. But after Ntuthiko's rather persistent encouragement, she eventually stepped inside. Muzakaisi admitted to the court that he then drove her out to a remote area, led her out of the car by hand, and then sadly shot her at point-blank range. He then loaded her back into the car, drove to a secluded veld near Rudenport, and hoisted her up the tree. Seho's autopsy report confirmed that a gunshot wound to the chest was her most probable cause of death although, sickeningly, it appears that she was still alive at the time of being hung. It was further noted that Ntuthiko had also used a burner phone for all of the text messages and phone calls with his friend, which, in theory, is a smart idea, but in the days leading up to Seho's death, both his original and burner phone were triangulated to be in the same location more than a dozen times, which kind of makes the burner phone idea entirely useless. Despite all of this evidence available, Ntuthiko still claimed to be an entirely innocent man, and as for the burner phone, he had his own perfect excuse. Apparently, it was so he could buy cigarettes in illegal bulk quantities, However, there was no evidence of such transactions ever taking place. Interesting side note, but in the surveillance footage, you can even see into the Kuyuza's burner phone to instruct Musikaisi. And speaking of, naturally, the most important piece of evidence to all of this was that surveillance footage. It placed the means, the opportunity, the victim, the self-confessed murder, and the man with the very strong motive all in one place. The most harrowing part to all of this was that the man watched the woman he once loved drive off into the distance, fully aware of the fate he had just sealed for her. With the evidence, testimonies, and motive in mind, it didn't take long for the judge to come to a verdict. And in fact, deliberation wouldn't even take longer than a single day. As you could have likely guessed, life in prison. Mr. Shorber, can you stand up, please? For all these reasons, Mr. Shorber, I am enjoined by the statute to apply the ordinary sentence for an offence of this nature. You will spend the rest of your natural life in prison unless the parole authorities consider you fit for release in the fullness of time. The court will adjourn.
Emotional scenes inside court as Ndutuga Shoba is sentenced to life imprisonment. Now I accept that, as Mr. Makabela submitted, I should not punish Mr. Shoba merely for pleading not guilty and maintaining his innocence. But that does not mean that Mr. Shoba is entitled to the leniency that was extended to Mr. Malapani. The default legal position in respect of both men is that they would both have faced life imprisonment unless such a sentence would be disproportionate. To say that Mr. Malapani's cooperation with the police rendered a life sentence in his case disproportionate is not the same as saying that Mr. Shorber is being punished for not cooperating with the police. I am also persuaded that Mr. Shorber's role as the prime mover in the planning and commissioning of the offence distinguishes his situation from that of Mr. Malapani. But for Mr. Shorber, Ms. Pule, Ms. Pule would not have been killed. But if Mr. Malapani had not accepted the contract on Ms. Pule's life, the facts of this case strongly suggest that Mr. Shorber would have carried on looking for a way to kill Ms. Pule with or without Mr. Malapani's help. A huge sigh of relief was felt after a sentencing, and Seho's family and friends were finally able to get a small piece of justice after his evil actions. Thanks to his bargain with the authorities, Muzikosi was able to reduce his sentence to a mere 20 years behind bars, which of course was thanks to his cooperation. Saying that, I'm not actually sure how South African prisoners deal with snitches, so those 20 years may pose a very unique challenge. Believe it or not, but Antutheko is still adamant that he is innocent, and has even appealed his conviction to the High Court. Spoiler alert though, this was already denied. Regretfully, Seho Fatso joins a concerningly long list of female victims under the ongoing violent epidemic happening throughout South Africa. Sadly, gender-based violence is one of the most prominent forms of crime in the country, and this doesn't appear to be slowing down either. Those who have followed me and this channel for a while will know exactly what I'm talking about. Seho Fatso Pule is one of several South African women covered here by Coffeehouse Crime. Krabo Mokoena, Jade Panayotiu, Uyanene Mukhtiana and Hanno Cornelius are just a few victims to name. They say that in South Africa, a woman is killed every four hours, with more than 50% of those chilling cases being at the hands of their partner. Comparatively speaking, this is a staggering five times more than the international average. Every time a new name is added to the ever-growing list, a new wave of pain and outrage fills the general public. Yet nothing ever seems to be changing. With such a widespread social issue, one could argue that education is likely the best option from this happening in future generations. But, to be honest with you, that is not good enough. The country as a whole needs to actively campaign against, scrutinise, and more severely punish domestic violence. The men, and respectively some women, need to actively call out violent behaviour, and the authorities must enforce stricter measures against any and all incidents they come across. It's extremely difficult to know what else to say here. Women just want to feel safe and those in South Africa are desperate for such a basic thing. And unfortunately, that campaign for change came all too late for our victim today. Seho Fatso Pule may have found herself in a problematic scenario, but no one deserves to die for such a thing. Seho Fatso was a beautiful, young, and ambitious soon-to-be mother, beloved by all of those around her. Always known to bring life into any room, she was the beacon of warmth, support, and encouragement. And sadly, she leaves behind a close-knit family, a large circle of friends, a promising future, and, of course, the opportunity to meet her future daughter. I hope that her aunt, her brothers, and her sister all find the support and comfort they need in the future. And so, my friends, we come to the end of another case today by Coffeehouse Crime. Thank you so much for being here for another video today, I really do appreciate it. So, what are your thoughts on the case of Seofatso Pule? Do you think that Ntuthiko is guilty? And do you think that Mozakaese should have got more time despite his bargain? I mean, of course Ntuthiko is guilty, but do you think there was any evidence to disprove otherwise? Please share your thoughts in the comments down below. Just a quick bump, but if you'd like to get early access to my videos, support the channel, and get exclusive content like Q&A videos and stories outside of true crime, 
please check out my Patreon channel. I'll leave a link to it down below. And of course, if you'd like to follow me on social media, please check out Coffee House Crime on Instagram and Facebook or Coffee H Crime on Twitter. Thank you again for being here, folks, and I'll see you again very soon for another video. But until that moment arrives, remember to look after yourself, look after each other, and of course, stay safe. Thank you, and goodbye.